So Anne, to dive right in, can we start with understanding the core question? Why does South Africa, a country with so much potential, still flounder? Well, let me say how delighted I am to be here and thank you for the invitation and lots of friends in the audience. And it's great to be interviewed by a South African. So South Africa is one of the few mineral rich countries that is middle income. And we're a society with enormous potential. We, we're a democracy with a constitution that works pretty well. There are few countries in the world developed or developing whose president is called up on national TV at the Zondo Commission and asked to account for his actions as president of the ANC, as deputy president of the ANC, and as leader of the country. We have an independent judiciary. We have an enormous country, really, a very big country with very beautiful, enormous potential for tourism. And of course, we have lots and lots of minerals, what you might call some of the old stuff or what Ricardo would tell us, some of the new stuff for, for green growth. Um, we have one of the developing world's most effective financial sectors. And we have a system of cities that is unusual in the developing world. Most developing countries have one big city that's kind of overwhelmed as the country urbanizes. South Africa has eight metropolitan areas of which at least five or six are reasonable places which are absorbing people in different ways. So we have a lot of advantages. And of course, we have great people, but uh, I'm not so sure about the politicians. Thank you, Anne. So South Africa is mineral rich. We've come through a peaceful democratic transition. We have a few strong institutions like our financial systems and private sector companies. However, on many global indices like inequality, education, unemployment, health and housing, South Africa is falling woefully short. Why are we in this position? So this is an important question. Um, they're probably different answers. Let me start by saying South Africa was always going to be a hard place to govern after apartheid. In centuries of discrimination, a very powerful and terrible system of apartheid that affected millions of people's lives, this was always going to be difficult. Um, on the other hand, I think there are three reasons why we are in the terrible situation we're in now. The first is what our president likes to call the nine wasted years, which are the nine years under the, his predecessor, President Zuma, who protestations of black economic empowerment notwithstanding, enabled a family from India to come and together with South Africans, black and white, essentially looted the state on an industrial scale. And in so doing, they undermined institutions. That's his explanation, but I don't buy that. I think he neglects to remind everyone that he was deputy president of the ANC at this time. He was chairman of the deployment committee for the five years at the height of state capture when people were put into top positions in key state institutions to loot to loot for themselves, to fund the ANC and all sorts of other things. So I'm less, con I think it's an, ad in, an inadequate explanation, nine wasted years as though that was somebody else and I, I'm the new guy. And I think in some respects you have to say we've had for the last five years a flailing reformer. He raised hopes, he seemed to want to do the right things, he has done some things. We are now starting to see a range of people who participated in destroying institutions being charged with fraud and other crimes. Nobody yet in orange overalls, overalls but I'm hopeful. Um, but the process is starting, and I hope a lot of people are getting very worried. 
So he has done that, and he has, or at least appointed people who are not corrupt to do that. He has also made one or two policy decisions that are potentially really important. In the energy area, for example, where South Africa is in deep trouble, um, we are now allowing, beginning to allow a market to for energy to, to appear, but we're very, very, we're at the very early stages of that and no guarantees we'll get there. I think so. We've had a flailing reformer who has failed to do a, a range of things from improving education to having people in his cabinet who are both corrupt and some are incomp completely incompetent. Uh, who knows the marriage of the two or what that means, but at the top levels of government, increasingly there are people who it's hard to ask a South African audience name me a minister you respect who can actually do their job outside of some pockets of excellence, which are the South African Reserve Bank and the National Treasury, and perhaps parts of the presidency. Uh, but the third reason we're in deep trouble is whatever the Harvard technical term is, bad policy decisions. They're bad policies that have come out of the ANC and have been implemented, of which the most important are cadre deployment, where they've appointed people to key positions to this day because of loyalty to the party rather than competence to do the job. And then the other thing I think has been absolutely critical is they fail to appreciate, never mind understand, the power of markets and firms to help transform South Africa. And so even when famously Nelson Mandela came back from Davos in the 90s and said, I've been persuaded we have to understand markets, global markets, and deal with global markets, and essentially move towards a social democratic rather than a communist position. At no time did he or his successor Mbeki persuade anyone else of why they had changed their minds. So there wasn't a big campaign to explain to members of their party or their government why they had moved to a very different approach to how to govern South Africa's economy. So to this day, we have Marxist language and we have far too much faith in a developmental state, which whatever you might think of this ideologically, is just a joke when we have a weak and corrupt state. So the ANC to this day and the president want the, the state to lead, the state to direct the economy. And this is just ridiculous, the current level of capacity, competence and integrity of the state from top to bottom. Mm. Those outcomes sound bleak. <laughs> mm. and I think despite um, those bleak outcomes, perhaps you and I share some optimism about our country. Um, you recently shared in a talk that um, South Africa is one of the top three countries after the US and Canada in its corporate citizenship. And I'm curious, what then is the role of South African business um, to maximize the corporate citizenship for the development of South Africa? Well, you're posing three very important questions. Let me take the easier one, which is, I have very strong views on the role of business in society, in any society. And I think the most important place to start that conversation is not where most people start it. Most people want to start with, what more are you going to do for our society? And they take for granted the running of a profitable legally compliant institution. I want to start the conversation with any successful modern business, and most of them do comply with the law, any company or firm like that is providing a service to society already. Otherwise, no one would buy their products. But they do much more than that. So being a profitable company means you're providing careers for the people who work for you, 
probably health care, unemployment insurance, pensions for the, them and their family, you pay taxes. These are the most legally compliant institutions in the history of humankind. That's where the conversation should start. That is their most important contribution to society, whether it's through innovation or being the corner store that I can go to or the pharmacy in the middle of the night. So that's, I think, really important before we start the conversation about what more can you do for society. And South African business, for a whole lot of reasons, has been very generous in post-tax donations to corporate social investment or whatever term you want to use. A lot of the time, like companies all over the world, this involves ad hoc projects. It's kind of nice picture opportunities for the CEO to open a new school or do something like that. It has started to change in the biggest companies who are trying to collectively have a bigger impact um, systemically on, say, education, but it's not nearly advanced enough. And my guess is that's the case in many other countries. So I think corporate investments, social investment is a really important, it's free money. It's money that doesn't have to be spent on teachers' salaries or all the things that public money has to be spent on. And that then implies much greater thought about how to use that money strategically and to have a real impact and the best advice I ever heard on this, which is easy to say but harder to do, is there is an American who said to me, you know, if you think of education, however generous, the American private sector, Canadian or South African, which at the time were the top three in the world in terms of proportion of money donated to social investment, it's less than 1% of the national education budget. So according to this person, which I agree with, private dollars should be used to influence how public dollars are spent. That's how you have impact in society. And that's easy to say, as I said. It's harder to do, but it is possible, and it requires a different kind of approach to how most people think about this. And I'm not talking about let me be polite, um, the current debate on Wall Street and elsewhere about ESG funds. A lot of this is marketing. A lot of it is hype coming out of companies and the industry around social investment. Shouldn't believe anyone. Don't believe all their reports destroying many trees on inputs. They tell you, oh, we spent this on, on entrepreneurship and that on something else and that. Who cares? I want to know about output. And most of them never tell you about output. So this is a much more complex area than I think is often allowed. Lots of, let's just call it marketing, <laughs> goes into this rather than reality. And we should be pushing much harder for serious engagement on serious issues. And to pretend that E and S and G can all be Bang together in one little happy phrase is ridiculous. Um, so I'm opposed to this glib sort of stuff, uh, but it's very important kind of precious money in a society. It should be used much better. And in addition to the, the dollar contribution, um, one of the ways that business can make a meaningful social impact is on job creation. And so this is an area that I lose a lot of sleep over, particularly in South Africa. And if we were to narrow in on that topic specifically, uh, how can businesses make more meaningful contribution to job creation and get people onto that first rung in employment? So... With respect to the way you're phrasing the question, South Africa has one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. So there's a lot of chatter about job creation as though business people get up in the morning and say, how many jobs can I create today? Most business people, 99% of them don't get up and think that. They get up and think, how am I going to make sure my company survives? 
and we can make a profit. Um, that's what they're thinking about. Jobs are a consequence of growth and firm development. So it's important to think about this properly. And I wish South African business would push back more at the government for this loose talk about this. So the real issue in South Africa, I think, is it's twofold. You have to create an economy that you facilitate economic development that deals with the, the workforce we actually have and not the skilled workforce we, we think we have or we wish we had. So you need jobs for the kind of workers that we have. How do you do that? Well, firstly, you have to facilitate it. You have to make it easier to create firms. And now I'm going to uh, reference Ricardo in some ways. On the one hand, you have to think about South Africa's spatial legacy and how expensive it is for poor people to get close to economic opportunity. Apartheid was all about keeping people away from the centers of economic growth. And inadvertently, not deliberately, the democratic government has had a housing policy that has pushed the poor further away, not brought them closer to economic opportunity. So that's so transport is clearly one big issue. The labor market is a, a second issue where the government. When the ANC came to power, they wanted a high-wage, high-skill sort of economy, which is fine, but they didn't bother to train the workforce. They have not improved basic education in any significant way. And our skill system, vocational skills, is expensive and, and doesn't produce the numbers of people trained to do what our economy needs. So we haven't done that, but we also have encouraged, if you like, the top end of the economy to do deals in a factory or in a, a workplace where the urban elite in the workforce make a deal with the employers and then the Minister of Labor extends the wages and conditions and hours and so on to everybody across the country. And that's very harmful. So we don't create nearly enough low-skilled jobs for the population that we have. And we keep talking about, as do people in America and elsewhere and the EU, they want decent jobs. I just want jobs for people to get a first foothold in the modern economy. And I think the more adjectives you put in front of the word jobs, the less jobs you'll get. Thanks for that, Anne. If we then abstract um, the questions a little bit, I'm wondering about what preconditions are required for business to co-author a prosperous future for South Africa or are preconditions a fallacy? Well, co-author is an interesting uh, way of putting it. South Africa needs a very different approach to how we run our economy. That requires a very different understanding of the role of the state. The South, current South African state is struggling to do the basics that any state should do, protect people's lives, protect property. Uh, small businesses are destroyed when, when crime happens and they're broken into and so on. So I think the South African state should concentrate on rebuilding, professionalize, and focus on the basics, fix the roads, uh, or get someone else to fix the roads, but the basics. And they should free up as much of the country as possible and as much of the economy as possible for private sector actors to operate in compet within competitive rules. Um, there are enormous opportunities to do that. So, Rest of Africa is some parts of it are really growing fast and South Africa can play a really important role there. In some ways, like Hong Kong did for China, that should be how we should be thinking about South Africa for, for the rest of Africa. But we have to stop monopoly provision of very basic services for the economy one thing to be a monopoly, to be a useless monopoly, to not allow competition, to not provide services, 
And the few services you provide, you provide very at a very expensive rate. That's electricity. Our ports are some of the worst in the world, and they should be some of the best. Um, and our railway system, which was a real asset, is, is not working very well. So there are a whole lot of things that need to be fixed. And in my view, so one of the South African dilemmas, and then I'll stop, um, is a lot of people know we have to reform. And the conversation goes like this. We have to do the following kinds of reforms. We've got to reform monopoly provision of railway power, ports, etc. We need to fix the roads. We need to do change the education system. We need to... The telecommunications needs to be completely modernized and much more competitive and so on and so on. But they say the state is very weak. So we all nod our heads. And then five seconds later, they tell us the state must do the following things to reform. And I'm the voice in the room that says, hang on, this state is going to really struggle to manage the reforms we need. The only capacity in the country of real significance lies outside the state, mainly in the private sector, which is an impressive private sector for a developing country. And they could do a lot more if the government would open up, seriously open up space for South Africa's, some of our world-class companies and our financial institutions to play a much bigger role, yes, to make profits, but to help rebuild the country. And that's, I think, the key variable. Thank you. Thanks for your, your, your insight and, I think, and wisdom as well. I think before we turn to questions from our audience, I'd like to end with a broader question. We've got many students in attendance who will work at the intersection of the public and private sectors after leaving HKS. What should these future policymakers do to unlock the potential of the private sector? in driving national growth? Sure. Um, well, let me restrict this to, I don't know, the way it's a big question. So I think the history of the last period globally has shown the enormous power of markets operating in competitive circumstances in imperfect countries. You don't need perfection. And I think that people who go into the state should understand the power of markets and how to, to use that to help develop countries. Um, on the other hand, you know, after all, if a clever state can get the markets to do all sorts of things or enable them to do all sorts of things and then claim this as their victories, it's not as though you have to, you then say, look what we've done. It's not that you're giving credit all the time. So there are clever ways to do that. On the other hand, I think that people who go into the private sector in various sort of, let's call it public affairs or dealing with the dreaded ESG, I think you need to be strategic. You need to think about the real role of companies and the enormous power of markets, qua companies, not, and then what else you can do as corporate citizens in a particular country. And I don't know, don't believe anyone, sort of do your own work and be skeptical about hype, but think hard about the role of the market and the state and how you can use that to, to change, to improve things for the better. Um, but don't be fooled by a lot of the I don't know, the chatter about all of this. I'm not sure if that's what you were looking for. But, uh... Thank you, Anne. Thanks so much. Uh, we'd like to welcome questions from our audience. Thank you. I believe we have a mic. Yes. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Anne, for a very informative discussion. Um, I'm also South African, so probably a little bit biased in terms of my questions, but I have two. The first is um, related to states and the private sector. 
I think I feel like there's an inherent distrust between the two, probably along political and racial lines in terms of the private sector being inherently white because of history in the country and government being historically black because of new emerging transition that's happening. Um, and how do we break down that barrier and create more trust between the two so that we can actually overcome some of these blockers? And then the second question is related to um, the state itself in terms of government. I think we've seen such an amazing emerging class of well-educated South Africans across all spheres. And how long will the ANC continue to have a hold in terms of old ways of governing with such young, vibrant energy coming through? And what does that look like? I think there are two things about business and government. I'm very hesitant about using the word we need. Three years ago, people would say, oh, we need greater trust between business and government. And I was on a platform the other day and I heard someone say that and I thought, there are a lot of crooks in government. I don't want business to have greater trust between, with them, we know what happens then. Um, I think, there is an ideological issue, which is the ruling ANC believes in a developmental state. They sort of fantasize about an East Asian state, but they aren't one. And until you break that fantasy, in my view, it's gonna be very hard to make real progress. That's the one issue. The second issue is the business sector is obviously not perfect. And there were leading companies involved in state capture, leading international companies from Bain to McKinsey. Don't go and work there, everybody. Um, uh, who behaved appallingly um, and other companies, S&P and others, they should be charged and people should go to jail if they broke the law. And I support the South African government saying they're not going to work with Bain in future and the UK government. Perhaps you could talk to this government. Um, so there's an ideological issue and it's our history. And it's almost like you want to say things are so bad. Can we talk about the future? We're lucky as a country to have the private sector that we do with all its imperfections. When COVID hit, the South African business community responded so quickly. And I have yet to find another country where the business community responded in the way that they did. They put up enormous sums of money for the public good. They organized themselves to help deal with, remember the days of PPE and so on, and then the vaccine. Without them, we would not have been able to vaccinate the percentage of the population that we have, not that it's fantastic. So I think they did an incredible amount. They also pulled together a whole lot of people to write the world's longest strategy document for the economy of a thousand pages. But, you know, the enormous detail and commitment and seriousness, but this needs to be recognized and there needs to be a whole different attitude. Our business also needs a different attitude to government. They think, what's wrong with these people? Governing is easy, and it's not. So there's some fault on either side, um, which I think needs to be dealt with. And how you cut through that, well, of course, there's always the option of a new government. You can throw the rascals out and put a new bunch in. Sorry, what was your second question about? Oh, right. What about young people? Well, you have to stop cadre deployment, first and foremost. So cadre deployment is the, the term in South Africa for the ANC government, ANC political movement, having a committee chaired by the deputy president of the ANC, who's normally the deputy president of the country, who sits and they discuss, who are we putting up for the judiciary? We have an independent process to choose judges, but this committee decides who they're going to put up, 
who they're going to put up for top positions, head of ESCOM, head of the ports, head of everything you can imagine. Now, they say this is just like any other country. We're the ruling party. We're making suggestions. And then in the government, there is an independent process of recruitment. But this is, doesn't hold water. Why would you have such very senior cabinet ministers, deputy minister generally of the country, chairing this political party's committee on who should get which jobs? If it's just, you know, doesn't matter. I don't believe it. Nobody believes it. And in fact, the deputy, the deputy chief justice of the country, now the chief justice of the country, in his report on state capture said that he thought cadre deployment was both illegal and unconstitutional. And there's no doubt in my mind that it's been a key factor in, in undermining state capacity because it would be, are you loyal to us? Will you give us a cut? I'm making it up of the loot you get. Will you make sure the procurement goes in a certain way? You can imagine the conversation that takes place, not are you a competent engineer and how many years of experience do you have and why should we put you forward for a very important position? So you have to cut this. And the ANC is divided on this. There's some leaders saying we should cut it now. But the key for South Africa is to hold the educated people that it, that it is training. And we now have many more black South Africans coming through our universities, more black engineers, more black teachers. We're doing, not fair, but consider our past, we're not doing badly. It's improving. So there are lots and lots of people coming through the system, but they need to then, like all of us, work in well-run institutions where you can learn on the job. Um, this is the home of know-how. How do you get know-how? You watch how the people running the engineering firm or the legal firm actually do their job and you put in your years learning and then improving as a professional. And that's not happening well, partly because of cadre deployment and partly because of, I think, a very badly implemented approach to black economic empowerment. Um, I'll stop there. Um, Um, I'm originally a Brazilian, but this summer working in, and I also summer a venture capital fund in the city. And one of the notice is it was very hard for the fund to make investments that went were led by white men to be Afrikaans and also used to be on their second or third entrepreneurship endeavor. And I think that there's a lot of conversation in the country, at least that I participated this summer that spoke a lot about how entrepreneurship can move the country forward. So BEE aside, I'm curious on your thoughts about how you can be able to leverage entrepreneurship that goes beyond the Afrikaans, white, Western Cape kind of uh, environment. And if you have any thoughts about how the private sector can do more things to do that beyond like Alan Gray founders and that kind of stuff. Lots of layers here. Yeah. Great question. Um, I would, I would stop BEE. I would stop the way it's currently legalized and implemented. I would fix education, which you can start making a difference in six years, but it really makes a difference. Some 70% of South African learners in our schools can't read, write, or add up in any serious way at all. So we can't discuss entrepreneurship with them. We should stop talking, in my view, nonsense, which is we look at a whole lot of unemployed young people and we say, gee, you should all become entrepreneurs. And they're people who generally come from homes where nobody works 
or a community where nobody works, you just set them up for failure. Very bad strategy. So we should stop wasting time there. I think we have a reasonable, but I'm not an expert, sort of venture capital sector, and it's growing. And there's lots of money in the banks and financial institutions to invest. So we need to allow the real entrepreneurs to emerge without preconditions, without you know, the BE kind of preconditions. And then we have to fix the environments in which they would operate. Okay, maybe sort of people don't know enough about this. These are an ever expanding set of regulations, which say to new investors, for example, you're about, you've discovered, you want to explore for minerals in South Africa and you'd like to set up a mine. You have to give away half your profits before you have any by finding a black partner who doesn't have to contribute anything. They just have to be black um, before you can get funding, before you can conform with the, the government's laws. So that's just one of the issues. Um, and they, there are a range of other BE constraints that hold back new investment and new investors. There are other issues. So leaving aside that, Take minerals, okay? South Africa has not invested in new exploration for the last, I think it's 20 years, it could be at least 15. Why? There's real possibility for all sorts of minerals, but there is dispute about the property rights system and what rights the mining companies will have. There are disputes about who owns which piece of property because we don't have an effective cadastral system. The mining sector said, we'll pay for another one. No, no, says the department, we'll do it. But they're incompetent. They have vested interests. There are all sorts of swirling accusations I'm not competent to assess. Why does this all take so long? So there are, there are a range of issues that hold back entrepreneurs. I think... In some respects, at a big level, there's a lack of confidence in how the country's been governed and a lack of confidence in where it's going. We don't have a vision for the future that's plausible and the politics is unstable. So they're big factors. The economy is generally stagnant and that's partly because big investors are not seeing the environment as one in which they can risk their money. So that's a part answer to your question. Hello, <laughs> my name is Douglas Barros. I'm uh, the Director of Policy Research at the Growth Lab. Uh, so many here or several here uh, are in their training students. And one element that at least in the MPID program they share about thinking about policy design is that good policy uh, needs to consider what is technically correct, what is administratively feasible, and what is politically supportable. And I think uh, we've uh, heard a, a lot of the direction in which how policymaking could improve in technical terms and where state capacity could grow. Uh, but I was wondering if you have some inklings, inside thoughts about what are elements of uh, political equilibrium or a political narrative, or a political coalition that would support these types of reforms. Uh, as Land Prichet would say, the current equilibrium is an equilibrium for a reason, because there is political support to what has happened. So what, what could be some uh, ideas about an alternative political equilibrium that would favor it? That's a vital question. Let me just start by saying I run a non-party political organization, so bear that in mind. I think one of the hopeful things about South Africa is that until about 2016, our elections were racial referenda. Because of our apartheid past, you could predict how people were going to vote, and it was race. It was the past, and it was race. 2016, a whole lot of mainly ANC voters stayed home. They didn't vote, about 3 million. 
which is significant in the country of Alsace or the number of people who vote in our country. And this phenomenon has, has increased to last year's 2021 municipal elections where they, they were run as really a referendum on the president. His face was all over the country. It wasn't like the local candidate, it was the president. They got less than 50% of the vote. They've lost the big cities, the current government. Vote the electorate. So we are entering an era of much more competitive party politics, which is healthy. After all, we haven't had a change of government, which some of the theorists would say is the key marker of a really democratic society. We have had a change of government in, we have provinces or states, we have nine of them, and in one, the, the ANC has lost power. And what happened there is they lost power initially by a very small margin, and it's just gets quite, it's big now. But in no other part of the country except in the metro governments and some smaller towns as well. So much more competitive politics and we're heading towards a general election. One scenario is that the current ruling alliance really, which is the ANC, the Communist Party and the one of the, the biggest trade union movement, although that's now split in two directions, um, that they retain a very small majority. But they will lose seats, which won't make people in their party happy. Um, so that's one scenario, probably the most likely as we sit here today. There is another scenario, which is that the ANC goes below 50%. Now, if they go below 45%, they're going to struggle to form a government unless they go in with the, the third party in South Africa's system, which is the economic freedom fighters, which sits at about 10, 11% of the electorate and are a very bad party. Let me just say they... They have a style of politics that's fascist. They are racist. They're violent, often, not all the time, but these are not a model Westminster style party. Um, now, there are many people in the ANC who fear getting into bed with the EFF, which is young and quite, um, they're smart. Uh, as many populists are, they're, they're smart energetic, and uh, I think it would lead to a breakup in the ANC. That's one possibility. I think it's, it's a possible alliance, but it would, it's unlikely, in my view, that it's possible. So if the ANC doesn't get into bed with them, what about the opposition? Now, if they get around 45% or less, if they're above 45%, they can do a deal with there are lots of little small parties, and we have a PR system for a whole lot of reasons, which unfortunately is not a great system for South Africa, but it encourages smaller parties. So above 45, you can find smaller parties to align with. Below 45, and you don't go in with the EFF, then what happens? That's the big question. So could there be an overture to the official opposition at 25% as we sit here today? Will the official opposition get into bed with them? A dying party? Corrupt? What are the pros? What are the cons? Uh, what's the deal? Or can the official opposition be the anchor for an opposition alliance that can take over government, perhaps as a minority? And that is not laughable. A few years ago, you would have told me to get out of here really ridiculous idea, but it's not laughable. So South Africa does have more competitive politics, which is good. Our good constitution has some imperfections. There's a big debate at the moment about whether or not independence should be allowed to stand for election and how you do that in a PR system. Too complicated to explain. 
I think the government has ducked this issue, unfortunately, because there is a solution. There is a, was a committee appointed um, a few years ago, which many, and then another committee recently that supported a mixed German type system, which more or less would, would in most people's view be a much better alternative, but we don't have that for 2024. But constitutional reform is, is on the table now. So there isn't a simple answer to your question, but I think that, I think that the situation in 18 months time is going to be worse than it is today. And the politics of that start looking interest, the politics, not living there, but the politics start look, looking much more interesting. I think there are going to be at least one new political party early next year of reasonable, sober um, social Democrats, let's call them, which will be a break with the ANC and it will be black, black lead. So it's, uh, this is the space to watch. It's very hard to predict as we sit here now. Very quickly, thank you, Soraya, for the moderation. Thank you, Anne. I am Mark. I'm from Haiti. I'm a mid-career here. Um, I'm more curious about the role South Africa can play in the region. You mentioned a little bit Asia. Um, so today we're looking at Nigeria, um, Egypt, who are actually ahead now. Um, what role and how do you think South Africa could actually help shape the continent? Look at how they calculate that they're ahead of us, but leave that aside. Um, uh, I don't really care. I'm not an Africa specialist, um, but I think there are enormous opportunities. One of the issues about South Africa and the region is migration, which I think is a really important issue. The country needs, South Africa needs skilled migrants and we have an ambiguous policy on that, but it's ironic. We have so much unemployment and we're desperately short of skills, even when we're growing at 1% per annum. To get to three, then we really need many more skills. So I think South Africa should be much more open to skilled people. We can discuss where you draw that line and where we make it as hard as possible at the moment. On the other hand, our borders are porous, more porous than they need to be in a policy area that's hard to have perfection. And we make it pretty hard for unskilled people to come in legally. Of course, there is corruption, so you can buy your papers, who knows how many, it's a very murky area. We also don't know how many people there are in South Africa. So we're talking I don't know who to believe. If you believe anyone in the state, they're generally angling for more, uh, more, a bigger budget for the police or the border patrol or the this or the that or home affairs. And whenever you talk to the academics, the number is dramatically lower. So I think we don't really know if we're honest. We did a lot of work on this about 10 years ago and it was quite clear that the numbers were vastly exaggerated in the media and by, by interests who want more money from the budget. But, but I don't know how much things have changed, really. It's bigger. I don't know about how much. So migration is clearly a critical issue in terms of the region. That's the one thing I'd say. The other thing I'd say is that the future of sub-Saharan Africa will be drastically affected if South Africa goes bad. And that should be prevented at all costs. Um, so that's, you know, I think we've not been very effective on trade and so on, but I'm really not an expert, I'm afraid, in that area. I can't help much. Collective business initiatives to address systemic challenges. And it'd be interesting, you mentioned the sort of COVID response in business for South Africa. What other examples are you seeing of sort of large scale collective um, industry 
efforts in education or you know, the National Business Initiative, are these, are these effective? Are these a model that could be relevant elsewhere? South Africa's business sector has got become more organized. As the situation has got worse, they've got more organized. They're also speaking out more than they used to. They tend to do a lot behind the scenes, trying to influence the government policy. I personally have advocated they should do a lot more in public and ensure that their, their voice and their vision for South Africa is communicated much more effectively to the society as a whole, rather than behind closed doors. There are collective efforts um, of different kinds, the COVID one notwithstanding. We put a lot of energy into trying to get South African business to, who spend the vast majority of their social investment on education to move away from ad hoc projects about 10 years ago. And we've, there have been movements and significant initiatives set up to do that. There are different ones. There's debate about effectiveness. There's debate about, have you made the state more dependent on the outside players rather than a stronger state, which we know is a danger. And we would argue that too few of the business initiatives are independently evaluated. So there's lots of hype, but very few independent evaluations. So it's hard to actually comment. With, with fairness, um, lots of energy, lots of marketing. I think in, in education where we have done a lot of work, there, has, there, ha, there are really significant initiatives. There are also a lot of questions about them. And there's, it's really hard for me to take it further than that in public uh, because I don't know enough. Now, there are other people who would come here and say to you, the National Business Initiative is doing a great deal of work on climate change. It's not my area. I don't know anything about it. Um, there are people who would say that individual companies, big South African companies, are doing an enormous amount. And one of the points I wanted to make about a comment earlier is people very simplistically talk about white capital and you know, the black government. I think the government is predominantly African now. And the ANC is 99% an African party now, which most people don't talk about. It is increasingly racially exclusive. But you know, I go to talk to a lot of boards in corporate South Africa and a few years ago, I was caught short because I just assumed I would be talking to a lot of white men. And I walked in and it was very clear I'd made a mistake. And I was changing my talk midway because I hadn't appreciated how, how much corporate South Africa has integrated. So there are big companies now where the mid-level of the company is 90% black, not through affirmative action, but through internal training or just pressure of numbers and people are starting to come through the ranks in a normal way, which is fantastic. They are useless at communicating this to the rest of society. Um, so I think there's lots happening, training and all sorts of things, but hard to be authoritative on a lot of it because Distinguishing hype from reality is very difficult. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. On that note, um, we'll close with the talk. Thank you so much, Anne. It's been a delight to speak with you and to hear your insights. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. <laughs>